Afternoon. All right, hold on. Oh, right. Okay, we'll jump a, a chart. I think I might have the answer to Kenneth's problem, but I'll get to that in a minute. Right, I've spent 30 years um, on the commercial and operational side of commercial PSB broadcasting in the UK. Um, so my comments come through that prism. It's given me a, a sort of healthy cynicism, but you'll get some perspective. There are probably more questions than answers, but uh, we'll kick off. On Digital Britain, my specialist subjects were media markets, DAB, and the funding of content. So that was my, my sort of input into that process. I want to touch briefly on four areas. A perspective on the UK, what we mean by PSB content, some learnings from the content side of the Digital Britain report experience, and then leave you with a possible alternative model, which might interest Kenneth. Right. The UK media scene is very heavily regulated, and the licensed services TV, radio, bear the brunt of that. Everyone has a point of view on TV scheduling in the UK, from every taxi driver you meet through to the Secretary of State, Prime Minister, and all points in between. In fact, it's almost a national sport. There are regulations for every single aspect of everything you see and hear, and they grew out of a period of broadcasting stability that lasted for 50 years. That's not to say there wasn't change. There was. It was just that the change was gradual, linear, and predictable. And the entities and people that were regulated could be seen talked to, were located in the UK, had assets that could be leveraged to ensure compliance, and generally played the game. It enabled regulators and politicians to engage in a degree of social engineering unseen in any other sector. It funded the BBC, created alternative platforms such as Freeview, Cable and Sky, and created the framework for a vibrant commercial sector to sit alongside what is now a predominantly subscription sector in the UK with the BBC as a legally, legally enforceable subscription and Sky enjoying an effective monopoly by virtue of its platform and rights. However, recently, the rate of change has been so great that the legal frameworks have been found to be wanting. They are often too narrow in definition and scope and simply unable to accommodate new technologies and business models. If a UK Comms Act lasts, say, eight years, with two years' consultation prior to enactment, it's simply not a cycle that can accommodate change quickly enough. Looking forward, hopefully the legislators in the UK, and they're in the middle of this now, will change the emphasis of the approach to enable statutory bodies such as Ofcom <coughs> to interpret and respond to changes within a broad but necessarily devolved discretion. I do believe that the content landscape should be gently managed and is, and is a source of social enrichment. We all just need to make sure that if things get too far out of control, there, as they are in the UK, we can bring things back into balance. So what is PSB content? Within the Digital Britain process, there was a lot of noise from the traditional broadcasters, TV and radio, and other licensed services, but it soon became apparent that life had moved on at a pace. The traditional view of PSB content for TV is high-end drama. So here's a different view. Take a weekday, 2100, so 9 o'clock weekday, one-hour drama on ITV1, which is the main commercial channel. It might produce an average share of, say, 22%, and that's about the same as the BBC at 9 o'clock. It's high-profile and valuable, has reach and plenty of light viewers, those who are more discerning in what they watch and are consequently even more valuable. But if you turn that on its head, 78% of those watching at that time avoided it. And if you take the total population and assume that only 50% were actually watching the TV at 9 o'clock on a weekday night, it means roughly 89% avoided it. Are we right to distort the system so much for a 10% minority? How culturally enriching is something that most people never see? The challenge is how do we provide true PSB content that reaches more of the people paying for it? If interventions are to be made to fill the market failure gap, we soon realised that TV and radio was not enough. Why not an iPhone app or an online game or a study aid or a type of mobile content or DVD content? Who says e-books can't deliver PSB content? Are there interactive versions of books that enhance and enrich our culture? Who knows? 
I don't, but what I do know is hard baking laws and licenses now will almost guarantee we are out of step sooner than we think. We need to make sure that we create entities that can channel funding to new ideas, platforms and content, and that they pass a broadly cast public value test. One area where we ran into difficulty is in the overlap between the cultural desires of the content regulators and the competition authorities in whose domain the funding of that content falls. In the old days, monopolies were granted by license and the returns were used to meet the license conditions, plus of course a modest profit. No room for competition laws as the government granted licenses circumvented the need. Now that markets have fragmented, market power has declined for many media players and they can't aggregate funds together to make the programs that we believe we want. It's one of the reasons Kenneth's chart had $500,000 as ad income. The net effect is licenses being handed back and genres such as drama for kids and adults, news and current affairs in decline, and that's not good for the viewer. The competition authorities do not incorporate a public value test that has cultural rather than economic measures. They seem only able to opine on things that they can add up within their narrow terms of reference. This has resulted in narrow definitions of markets and remedies that can only work within a market and no trading of market power for a societal gain. Regulators and governments need to be joined up in their thinking where culture and markets overlap. There needs to be explicit recognition by all that a difficult to measure cultural benefit might be worth trading for a measurable economic effect. This is another area where speed is of the essence. Media markets move fast and hard to nurture sectors and activity can easily be crushed by unchecked market forces. I'm not arguing for easier regulation, just faster and more comprehensive regulation. Here's an example of what I mean. This is the cost to advertisers of all TV airtime in the UK across the last 20 years. So that's take up, add up the total amount of eyeballs generated by all the stations in the UK and divide it by all of the money that they take. It's not ITV, it's Channel 4, Sky, uh, all the other channels that are out there. As you can see, the rot or the decline started in about 2000, just as the web took off and the multi-channel universe started to increase the supply of eyeballs. Market regulation prevented the stations consolidating and putting their prices up. The result is the actual price of airtime in 2008 was the same as 1994. And in real terms, it's 40% cheaper. That's why the system is under strain, and that's the impact of non-reactive competition policy. In the UK, the government's looking to find about 150 to 200 million pounds to fund PSB content. This is seen as the missing gap for news, kids, and some other genres. There's been much hand-wringing, possible deals with Channel 4 and the BBC, and of course cash from the Treasury, if there's any left after the bankers. Total TV revenues in 2008 were £3.2 billion in the UK. If TV revenues had kept, place, kept pace with RPI since 1986, it would have been greater than £7 billion. So in effect, airtime prices could have increased by 10% in 2008, which would have delivered £320 million in extra cash to fund the programmes we want, and those prices would still be 33% cheaper than in 1986 in real terms. I know you can play with the date ranges, but I think you probably get the message. So in summary, the markets move faster than current laws and legislators. Just look at the banking crisis. Market power is good if its benefits don't simply flow to shareholders. The ad market is alive and kicking and crucially greatly values the kind of content that traditional media deliver, high impact, emotion moving events in history. I was interested here, the previous speaker was saying that out of a, a worldwide audience, potential audience of one and a half billion on the web, smashing satellites into the moon managed to get five million. Two weeks ago, on a Sunday night, on a small island off Europe, ITV generated 14.8 million people watching The X Factor on one event on one night. There you go. That's me.